Hey, welcome everybody back to the Startup Studios podcast with Raj and Seth. How you doing, bro? Man, feeling good. Feeling good. Well, yeah, I'm super, yeah. <laughs> I'm super excited to introduce our next guest, uh, Timothy Lipton, who, um, just to give you a little backstory. So imagine this, it's about 2014, 2015, I'm working with F50.io, which is this, like kind of venture capital um, connecting platform. Or at the time, it was mainly a community. And my job was to host events around the Bay Area and try to find VCs, investors, and people to just kind of come. That's how I met Tim, just through LinkedIn, reaching around. Um, he's been an awesome kind of advisor and friend since. Uh, we're going to get into it. But I think, Tim, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate That's it. That's very gracious. Thanks for having me. Of course. So it's my pleasure to actually introduce my my buddy, Raj, who I think you're going to really get to know uh, or like uh, more so than I am, because, or more so than me, because of his financial background, too. Tim, it's a pleasure, man. Yeah, so I'm super excited. Started over at uh, Energy Invest Banking and then kind of migrated to running a hedge fund for about 12 years. Uh, PKUM is about a billion, too. Uh, been having a lot of fun, kind of a second life in 2015 and, and moved to Seattle and now we're building a SaaS solution. So I'm kind of right in that spot as, as, as for whatever Tim's been looking at, you know, we're looking to the pre the seed round and, and I don't know what I don't know as a founder, that's a non-technical founder. You know, I, I didn't have a network here in Seattle and what Seth was doing with startup studios was exactly what I needed. Um, so super happy about, you know, kind of what we've been building out. I'm super excited to learn more about you, Tim. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much. Of course. Awesome. So let's just dive right into it. So who is Timothy Lipton like from the beginning, please? Uh, well, I grew up in uh, Southwest Virginia and um, went to, you know, went to school there. And my after, uh, so I, I guess things that I did growing up was I learned to sail at a young age. I learned to snow ski at a young age. Two hobbies that I've maintained, uh, carried with me. I played lacrosse uh, starting fairly young, uh, I think fifth grade or something, and I played all the way through men's club in Nashville, Tennessee. So I, I played uh, goalie and lacrosse for about 20 years. Um, I went to Vanderbilt, and that I ultimately uh, got an econ degree, and I had such a good time in Nashville that I ended up staying there. I started working with uh, Dean Witter um out of college and so i was a initially a data entry analyst and then i moved up to a registered rep and then commodities uh trader and branch manager and then i transitioned to memphis at morgan keegan and became an equity research analyst in consumer electronics and Wait, then how, was, how long was were those phases like um at i Dean would Witter, say how long were you I would say I was. I spent about seven years on the retail side of the business before I moved to Memphis, and then I uh, teamed up with uh, uh, a Wall Street All Star, and we were in the consumer electronics space. So I spent about three years doing kind of soup to nuts in you know that PC vertical. Um, you know the what, best what buys. What year was this? Uh, it's probably around two thousand. Okay, so we're, we're so early in the dot com. Yeah, yeah, and and I was, you know, I was young, and this was my first foray into more of the institutional side of the business. Um, you know, my three Real quick. So, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say my three years in equity research really taught me how to think. I mean, that was my MBA. Um, I got, you know, I passed CFA level one. Uh, I was, you know, in charge of doing all of the modeling uh, for our group, and a couple claim to fame is, you know, I had a couple. Uh, billion dollar companies and my internal model was within tens of thousands of dollars of the CFO's internal model. So that was kind of fun. Um, and, you know, it really helped me understand, uh, you know, the KPI relationships, the financial modeling, you know, the relationship between the three financial statements and gave me, that's where I got bit by the bug working with founders, you know, cause I would spend, you know, 45 minutes, um, I had a clip on uh, speaking with the CEO and we would have a very freewheeling conversation. They'd ask my advice. I would, you know, try to get information about their company from them. And it just really, that's when I realized that I really wanted to work with founders, which is, which led me on the path to where, where I am now. Awesome. 
So b before we kind of go into what we'll call the next phase, right, of, of your kind of career with founders, I'd love to hear a little more about like, like between high school and college, like your interest in finance, where did that really come from? Or, or kind of, I think, did you, did you think you were going to go down this path? Like when you were, uh, I, I didn't, I, I can't say it was so much intentional other than it was pretty clear. I had a, a somewhat of an entrepreneurial bent, you know, I think one of the things that I did in high school, there was a, uh, organization called junior achievement. And so it was one of those things where you show up for, I don't know, 12 weeks or something in a group of 15, 20, uh, high schoolers, you know, self-organize, come up with a project, implement the project, you know, try to generate a little revenue. And then, uh, that gets, you know, and then you just kind of wrap it up and how successful was it? So it was kind of my first foray into, you know, KPI light, um, uh, concept and and i ended up uh with a friend of mine we ended up taking the the management roles and we ended up building i think uh cd cases back in the day which you know it's pretty funny you know we talk about that most people probably don't even know what a cd is <laughs> <laughs> but you know so it was an experience you know you build these little cd cases and you go to all the local record shops the independent shops and you say hey will you throw these on the counter and sell them for 10 bucks whatever uh, so it was a, a bit of an opportunity to self-organize, kind of understand the responsibilities of, you know, a manager, trying to figure out what are the the costs of the thing, how do you divide uh, division of labor, you know, who's going to sell them, who's going to build them, who's going to be responsible for following up, you know, who deals with, you know, cash, even though it's, you know, tens of bucks, you know, at the end of the day, you still had to be responsible for it, get it into a bank account, that kind of fun stuff. And that, that probably... Um, was my first exposure to business and kind of the intangible side of the world because I think that's what drew me to finance um, out of college. Because at Vanderbilt, I I basically didn't have a clear understanding of what I wanted to do. My studies were split pretty evenly between history, philosophy, and economics. Um, and at the time, I remember I had one of those roll your own majors that Vanderbilt allows. And my uh, advisor was a head of philosophy, uh, Professor John Locks. And I remember going in junior year, um, talking to him, and I said, you know, this, this, you know, customized major that I've come up with, I was like, no one's going to hire me for this with this degree, are they? And he's like, yeah, probably not. I was <laughs> like, I should, I should probably switch to econ, huh? And he goes, yeah, probably. Um, so it was a funny conversation, and I'm I'm pretty sure I'm the only uh, econ grad from Vanderbilt whose uh, advisor was a head of philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So that might be indicative of how I got where I am. <laughs> yeah. No, actually, that, that makes a lot of sense now. Knowing you for the last, like, five or six years, um, there's definitely a, philo a philosophical approach to what you bring. Um, um, you know, and so when I left uh, Vanderbilt, you know, I had an econ degree, so I had something that was semi-manageable. Um, I, I had actually looked at some of their uh, bundled degrees where you could throw a, uh, a law degree in that, throw an MBA, and I just didn't know what I wanted to do. So I just didn't feel comfortable signing up for another three years, even though in, in hindsight, uh, you know, bundling this with a law degree would have been pretty useful. Um so I ended up working on Wall Street. I went and just knocked on doors and got a, a broker at Dean to hire me. And, you know, I was the kid that was doing data entry, um, you know, and three months later, I showed enough promise that he suggested I get registered. Um, nine months later, I'd, I'd uh, showed enough promise that I was given permission to pursue my commodities license. Um, and Is so the then we started. Then, Tim? Yep, that's correct. And then I, so I started, uh, you know, wrapping managed futures out to institutional uh, groups and, you know, doing modern portfolio theory, uh, the trumpet graphs with, um, you know, the, the correlation of assets and money managers. And so I really got into dealing with intangibles and I was having fun. I was enjoying it. Um, and this, this was still on the commodity side, those derivatives? Uh, well, this is really managed money, right? So I, I needed the degrees to help people understand what the products were and to sell managed futures. 
Yeah. Uh, but I wasn't doing direct trading. It was all managed. Okay. And it was, you know, looking at correlation of assets and, you know, doing the analysis and going back to folks and trying to, you know, put their portfolio on the efficient frontier. Hey, Tim, uh, real quick. Actually, that's a great segue. And, and I apologize for asking because, Seth, what he's trying to say is, and I think it's great for founders, because a lot of us as founders, especially going out to like raise, we're like, well, what is this? portfolio theory and thesis of these VCs and what are they de So it's very much what Tim's talking about on the personal side, de-risking and making a kind of, you know, a, a portfolio that he knew that the private investor or private, you know, wealth management could use. So that's a really interesting kind of, it's the same correlation. I mean, you see these VCs kind of doing it right now. They're like, Hey, we might not check a box because it doesn't fit with our thesis and it doesn't work for the full portfolio, even though it could be a great value add. So I know a lot of founders right now would love to understand like, Hey, what is that even works on the private wealth side? I mean, at what point does it, at what point were you like, okay, my allocation isn't making sense. Let's just go to the next person because they're, you know, they're kind of spinning their wheels right now as, as investor. I mean, as, as, as founders. Is that a question for me? <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, have you seen, was there ever a point where you're like, okay, on the managed, on the managed money side, you're dealing with a client that's just so hard that you're like, I got to just go to the next client and not waste as much time. Obviously, if they're part of the bank at Dean Witter, but like, because I know a lot of founders, if they're working with VCs trying to raise right now, like we are, it's like, well, it doesn't really fit in our portfolio. Our risk is too high yeah. and our concentration is here, here, and here. Then at some point you're like, cool, do I keep kind of telling you or do I like, cool, let's just go to the next person. Well, I, okay, so that I think there's uh, some adjacent uh, reflections I have on that. One, one is, you know, as a stockbroker, when I was first doing that business, it's the dialing for dollars fund, right? And, you know, the expectation is you're going to make 100 phone calls to find one person that has a personality fit, that has the need, you know, all the stars align with that one person. So that's probably going to be a client. Uh, so that really is a corollary to what founders are doing because you know when you get an investor even more so than a, a customer in business it's a marriage that person is not going anywhere until you sell the company um or go public and you maybe you exit <laughs> and they stay with the company um and so this is a long-term relationship so you really want to understand the personality that you're getting involved with and the um to to pick up another little uh Truism I like is, you know, cash is king and culture is queen. So it's really important to understand the personality fit. Uh, we use the Myers-Briggs uh, testing internally uh, at Momentum Finance to do the identification of personality and whether it's a good fit. I mean, it's not uncommon for us to go into a client and identify that the three people on the finance team, none of them are detail-oriented. And it's like, you know... That's that's a quiet conversation with the CEO and go, hey man, uh, or ma'am, th this this is you you are missing a key uh, personality trait for this department, you know, um, you know for that is something that is very important. So I think that in a in a big broad circle return, um, when you're looking for a, a good fit. It's both the quantitative, which is the modern portfolio theory, the efficient frontier. It's also the personality, the culture side, uh, because this relationship is going to go on for a long time. Another thing that I think is really a neat tool is, you know, I recommend that all my founders use safes. Why is that? It's because that's a screening mechanism. If that investor is is demanding a convertible note, you learned a lot about that person's personality in that one it's question. binary. It's binary. That's awesome. Yeah, and if you know if they if they're open to a safe, they're founder friendly. They're supportive. They're not going to rake you over the coals, you know, because everything costs more and takes longer than you want. So the expiration date on that convertible note's probably going to be problematic. I mean, I would say eighty percent of the material speed bumps I've seen. I've probably worked with a hundred founders, and I've the most of the speed bumps are associated with having to extend the term of a note and you know having to give up something for that because you're you're uh, you're vulnerable when you're asking these investors to do something and uh so if you can just wave your hands expiration dates interest rates go out the window um now you have someone that is more aligned with you which is mission critical in the the founder's journey 
Oh, that's amazing site. Thank you. Um, we're we're going to come back a little deeper on that, I think, towards the end. But so let's bring it to um, you were talking about uh, now you had decided that you wanted to work more directly or more closely with founders. Where were you at at this part of your life? You know, where's your head at and what's the risk? Or what, what are you thinking about? Well, it was a very interesting um kind of eye-opening opportunity for me because I was at Morgan Keegan. Uh, we, I had just been, I spent my three years in equity research, was given a, uh, a decision. I could, you know, take my own industry, pick my own industry. And I love consumer electronics. I was a, you know, I was a geek growing up. I wrote my first video game when I was 13. Um, you know, so I was like, yeah, I'm into this. I, I want to do this. And I was like, well, maybe I can become the banker for our group because I really, I don't want to give this industry up. Maybe I can be more useful and I can go learn another facet of the industry. Um, so I jokingly say I got kicked upstairs to investment banking. And uh, about nine months later, Regions Financial comes in and buys the firm. And part of that was, you know, there was a bit of a downturn, you know, the bubble and all that fun stuff. And so they short-sightedly let go 70% of the bankers. And I was one of the newest bankers. So... I found myself sitting at home uh, trying to figure out, you know, next steps. This was like it was, 2008-ish? Uh, uh, no, no, no. This is much earlier than that. Uh, this is uh, 2002-ish, I think. I was about okay, to say so the, dot com. the dot com crash, yeah. Yeah. And um, so, you know, I'm sitting there on a Saturday, and I got a very interesting call. Uh, a friend of mine who was the former COO of the firm, um, his golden parachute was a lot nicer than mine. Uh, but he called me up and he goes, hey, you know anything about politics? And I was like, well, I don't know. My uh, my cousin was, uh, you know, when I was, you know, four years old, was the the, the governor of Virginia. Uh, but that, that's the extent of my political. Uh, oh, so most politicians. So, yeah, yeah. Came from that family, right? <laughs> so, but it was interesting. So he goes, all right, well, you want to be my campaign manager? I'm like, yeah, sure. So I, he, we helped him uh, uh, go get elected mayor of his hometown up in the Northeast. And so that was, you know, that was my transition, you know. So I went from, you know, sitting at home, being unemployed in my house in Memphis, overlooking the river, trying to figure out what next steps were. Uh, so that gave me something to do for nine months. So got my friend elected mayor of his hometown. Um, and then I had an opportunity to... Uh, go help a buddy in California recover from an ACL surgery. So basically, I gave myself 90 days to live on his couch and then kind of figure out um, how to get my sea legs in the Bay Area in San Francisco. And so that was the beginning of my journey to being a lone wolf CFO in the Bay Area. And I had, I, at the end of that 90 days, I'd found an apartment. Um, I'd met some founders. And, you know, I basically spent the next 10 years kind of lone wolfing it. And it was, it was kind of crazy. It was a, it was a roller coaster because sometimes you got paid. Sometimes it was equity. Sometimes it was a blend. Sometimes things went well. And it was just, it was ridiculous. And so that roller coaster was driving me crazy, even though I was very passionate about the role um, of being able to support these founders with, you know, my Wall Street experience. And my understanding of, you know, how to create a adult financials, you know, how to. And, and the other piece to circle back is the thing I learned about equity research is everybody there is a quant person. So they're good at spreadsheets. The differentiator is the storytelling. And if you can wrap together a competitive story or a unique story relative to make up the number, the 10 or 15 other analysts covering that same public company. If your story made more sense or your story was more creative or strategic, because all of your spreadsheets looked very similar. So you differentiate yourself by your storytelling and, you know, the white papers that you would write. Because I used to, that was back when uh, HDTV was just turning the corner. Uh, we were going from standard def to, a, you know, and so the arguments were, you know, everybody in the planet's going to have to upgrade their TV. You know, well, that's a pretty compelling, compelling tailwind for the good guys and Best Buy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
this was the store within a store for Radio Shack when Sprint mm-hmm. would basically rent out a um, hundred square feet of a Radio Shack store, and they would have the store within a store, and that concept expanded to Best Buy and some others. So this was there was some innovation happening in the retail side of things, and we would tell these stories. And you know, I realized that the language that you used—I mean, it was kind of silly—but we used to use the term "growthier" in some of our reports, and our um, institutional investors knew what we meant by that term. Like that term meant, meant a number, and you know, that was a return that was you know, you know modestly higher than market. You know, and they're like, "Okay, so this is this is a kind of a code for these guys telling us that this is a buy." even though maybe it's a neutral on, on the public rating. Um, so, you know, you just learned a bit of the nuanced way of the nomenclature of finance. And I was bringing that to the conversations with our supporting my founders. I mean, I didn't have much gray hair then. Uh, but again, I had a little bit of experience so that when we would sit down for an investor conversation, you know, I'm talking, you know, Wall Street speak. And this is complimenting the founder. I mean, to take another uh, story tangent, I, I always joke with my founders. I said, if you have an hour with an investor and you spend more than five or 10 minutes talking about the financials, you lost. That's, that became an intellectual exercise. That person's going to try to tell you how to model better. They're going to try to tell you what the KPIs you need. To, they're going to try to tell you how to run the business. If they look at your financials and they're like, this is boring. This looks like every other 10K I've ever looked at. They want to learn about you, what's your passion, what's your vision. That could be a successful meeting. Uh, and so, you know, that's that comes full circle to why I believe that the financials for early stage founders need to look as 10K-esque as possible. Because you want to look the standard, um, you know, the, the, the exact same formatting, the same departments, the same multi-year um, estimates. You want this stuff to look, Plain vanilla, you know. Creativity hey, is no business in your spreadsheet. Tim, brilliant, and I, I, I want to push on or ask a clarifying question. Could you over 30, 30,000 square foot view? Because I just went through ten k of SVB last year when I was seeing what their their because you know their hedges started expiring. I was like, they didn't, they didn't keep going. Can you tell everybody to them like what what would you say is a ten k? Like so, how should I so a 10K, like really yeah basic basic for these founders? Yeah, so you know as a public company. There's uh, this transparency of reporting. And so the 10K and the 10Q are the annual and the quarterly reports, respectively, that are presented to the world. And there is a standard format. So the thing that I like about the concept of a 10K is every company on the planet can be crammed into that template. There's, you know, the purpose of that template is to explain every business on the planet in a standardized format. You know, you've got that you know, the top line, your cost of sales, and then you have SG&A, which is comprised of R&D, sales and marketing, G&A. And those departments exist in every company. And so the devil's in the details. It's those little uh, italic numbers in the top corner, the financial notes where all the exciting stuff happens. But the standardized format of the way you uh, display the profit and loss or the income statement, the balance sheet, and the cash flows is the same. And there should be a summary, uh, you know, P&L, balance sheet, cash flow statement for every company um, at a very high level as part of, you know, the founder's understanding of the company and how they express that in numbers to the to key stakeholders, whether it's board members or prospective investors or, or whatnot. And this standardized format allows people to take you know, every company on the planet, various industries, various countries, and have some kind of normalized way to look at it. Um, you know, the other thing uh, is, so there's there's two key takeaways for me when I did my, my CFA level one is those three statements, those trifecta financial statements, the income statement, the cash flow, and the balance sheet, you give me any two and I can give you the third. And to understand that intuitively is very helpful for a founder to appreciate it because they also have a little context of where questions can come from uh, in due diligence. The other piece is the normalized income statement, which is everything 
in percentages as a percentage of uh, top line revenue. And so that's a way, again, you can, you can cram any set of numbers into some kind of a standardized format because now you're talking percentages. So whether it's a big company, a small company, um, a U.S. company, a foreign company, uh, now all of a sudden you can just look at percentages. And those, you know, that's a normalizing factor in math. So that kind of, those insights and that kind of presentation uh, makes you look smarter when you're meeting with investors and board members because you're, you're using the standardized formatting, which is, uh, you know, math is, uh, what, what we jokingly say, the, the language of nature. Um, you know, finance is the language of business. And so if you demonstrate your ability uh, to present your company in the standardized financial uh, formatting and nomenclature, you know, you're halfway there. Um, the other thing I would say is I've had a couple of founders pull me aside and say, I'm not a numbers guy. And I'm like, well, then you can't be CEO. I'm going to, uh, this is, uh, sorry, Seth, you, 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 you messed up because now you got a finance guy in here. So Tim, <laughs> I love this. I had a question before and I'm going to get it to you, but this is even more apropos. So, so we're taking a step back because there's, there's two, there's two, there's a juxtaposition. You're, what if you're so new and you're so you're pre-revenue? Okay, don't even worry about financial. Yep. You'll, you'll get everything from anybody. And then you get to the point where at what point as a founder, cool, I have seven months, eight months, 11 months. I need my five years. So my projections, my pro forma, I'm, I can't DCF out shit. Like I'm over here just like kind of spinning to a point where like, yeah, actually our MRR by the end of year four is 400 bazillion dollars. <laughs> <laughs> at some point, the VC's like, I can make shit up too, but I won't. So like, at what point <laughs> well, does it become a dangerous to like a well, founder, think, pre-revenue? I think there's there's two things here. One is everybody knows the numbers are made up. Okay, so there's a little asterisk <laughs> and everybody gets it. But is there some, you know, the, the term swag or the term I like to use, hand grenade accuracy. Like, is there some <laughs> scientific approach to why you made certain assumptions. Oh. Um, that's the other thing is, you know, let's say you're a paper napkin founder. There's three things you're expected to understand about this concept of yours. How to balance a checking account. What are the costs associated with doing something? And what is the market willing to pay for that, that service? If you can at least paint, again, hand grenade accuracy, though, like, you know, balancing the checking account, that is a key core concept. If you don't understand that, do not pass go. Okay, so that's just straight, you know, that's finance 101. But what are the costs associated with doing the thing? Like I was talking to a founder, a high school student that I'm mentoring for a local uh, competition in Park City. And, you know, the conversation was around his concept. I said, okay, you want to do this thing. Peel back the onion in your mind. What are the steps to do the thing? And then even if you have to do them yourself, have an insight as to, well, at some point, I'm going to be too busy. I'm going to have to have a third party do this for me, an employee, a vendor, whatever. What are you going to have to pay them? So you're going to start understanding the concept of my time is worth money. My time, the, the, my time maybe could be better spent doing something else. Um, and what's the lowest cost provider to do the, the task? This is the cost of sales. And then what's the value? Um, you know, I've got these little uh, truisms I love tossing out in my entrepreneurship talk. You know, as a founder, in a perfect world, you want to deliver three to five times the value that you take. And this is just a mentality. Like, you want your employees to get three, five times more value between compensation, cash, and equity than you're receiving from them. You want your employ you want your customers to receive three to five times more value. This is a floor, right? You know, um, then they're paying you. So if they're paying you thirty bucks, you want to make sure that they're getting a hundred, hundred fifty, two hundred dollars in value from that thing. Like this is just a mental math where you want to give more than you take, and this is this is a, a way to look at this. So this is where you start trying to where's the rubber meet the road. What is someone going to pay for the product or service? And now I have some estimation of the cost of doing it. 
Like, this is where you start. This is entrepreneurship 101. It was like, I got to know how to balance my checkbook because I got to know inflows and outflows. I got to know what it costs to do the thing. And I got to have some sense of what people will pay, what the price the market will bear uh, to receive this product or service. And that is just the bottom line of, does this idea make any sense? Is this, uh, is this scalable? You know, is this something I want to spend the next five, seven, ten years doing? Um, so these are some of the, the early stage questions that I think inform, you know, as you mature and things get more sophisticated. I mean, Raj, like you were saying, at some point, the model, there's, there's historical data. Like, it's not just made up stuff then it becomes a little more interesting. I mean, the worst thing that can happen for most founders is they start, they're profitable. Well, because now it's aspirational valuation is out the window. Now somebody's looking at you as DCF and you're not going to like that answer. <laughs> no, that's so, so wild because, and Seth, you, you need to annotate this, like plaster and everywhere, those three things, because Tim makes a great point point. something we just dealt with with a, with a, with a founder and a, and a company and brilliant group. But they're more like B2B. It's a B2B to C, but we were trying, we were trying to push, but well, what's your CAC? They're like, well, we have like, we've renewed and, and no, we don't really have a CAC. I was like, but there was, um, imagine moving, you know, major systems, ERP systems or whatever it might be. There's a, there's a latency, there's an accounting move. There's a, this, there's a heavy lift of actual devs being like, okay, this dirty, this data here. And then I'm like, well, candidly, that was 20 hours of one of your devs. Like that's your CAC. People don't yeah. understand like payroll. Like, even for me, I was like, well, we don't really have a CAC. I was like, how long did it take you to manually just move all that crap around? You're like, a week and a half? Like, there's your CAC. So it's just so interesting that you you bring up such an important point of, hey, replace your time with a monetary value for the future. Yep. And, you know, you need to, like you just said, there's a mental exercise, the mental calculus of figuring out, okay, so this is not how IBM does it, but how am I going to do it? Like yeah. I, what, what, what are the assets and the liabilities that I have yeah. that I have to ascribe value to? And it could just be opportunity cost. Right. Um, you know, I mean, that's what I say to most of my clients. And it was like, there's no question at the paper napkin stage, you can do your own books. You can do your own model. The question is if it's a color coded, you know, format, you know, that you failed, that's, that's not going to be received well. But the other thing is, what's the value of your time? You could be out recruiting a co-founder. You could be out getting your first board member. You could be out doing 100 things that are more productive than you not paying us, you know, a few hundred dollars to do your books. So it's one of the, it's the allocation, which, you know, we'll, we'll get to this later in the conversation, clearly. But my, I, I have a barbell approach to the perfect avatar of who the founders I want to work with. It's either the first time entrepreneur that doesn't know what they don't know, or it's the repeat offender, the recidivistic entrepreneur where this is their fifth or sixth company. And they're like, the, you'll take care of my back office. You'll give me reports once a month that I can spend five minutes confirming that everything's where I thought it should be. And that's, and then I get spend less than an hour of my time and attention per month. And I pay you to manage my back office. So that's the two places where it's incredibly valuable. Tim, can I hire you? Yes, sir. Done. <laughs> Seth, I gotta go. No, that's so that's so appropriate. That's awesome. That's awesome. No, well, you know, actually, well, it, this is this is the result of like you know decades of working directly with founders, and you said a hundred companies, you know. But I want to also give the the, uh, the listeners a sense of what kind of like. You, you started working with these founders at the very early stages, right? Like, can you give us a sense of where, like, with that distribution, where it's obviously a smaller percentage are successful versus, sure. you know, everything else? Like, I'd love to not only get into the story of how you found them, but then, you know, all the learning. Well, I, you know, I had my own founder's journey, right? So, you know, it took me 10 years of wandering through the wilds of startup land to, you know, firm up my vision of for momentum finance. For me to, you know, wake up one morning with the epiphany, it was like, oh shit, I'm doing this wrong. Uh, because I was a dedicated individual, 1099 or an employee or whatever, for these startups. Um, 
and it was it was pretty much a one to one marketing thing. I go out and I meet people. And I convince them to hire me. Uh, I would do a job, and you know because I did you know when we did consumer electronics, we had a little bit of special situations work on Wall Street. You know it was not uncommon for someone to drop a bunch of industry information on my desk and say you know give me a model in seventy two hours. The bank wants a fee. Um, so, you know, you're going to cover this company while we IPO or whatever. And, you know, so I probably modeled, you know, 15 different industries, you know, and at the early stage, the paper napkin of series B, there's, there's no, uh, rocket engineering going on here. You know, this is just make sure things are categorized correctly and understand your cogs, your KPIs, that kind of stuff. Um, obviously most of my clients are SaaS because that's kind of the nature of the business model these days. Um, but, you know, I've worked with 3D printer companies and all sorts of physical things as well. Um, but working with these founders, one of the other things that I realized is you don't really know, going back to that uh, personality fit with the investors and founders, I had a similar relationship. Uh, you know, the CFO is... is uh, auspiciously kind of that second in command, right? And so I would get to know that person, uh, warts and all. And quite frankly, you know, it could be 90 days before I figured out, like, this really isn't the person I want to work with. Mm. And, you know, I might be semi-pot committed. You know, I got most of my comp in equity. Um, and so one of the, the epiphanies I had is after that, that roller coaster period with Momentum Finance, I was primarily referral driven business. So I would have attorneys and friends and founders that had worked with me previously that we had a good relationship. Um, and I kind of use, you know, my metric is, is the, is the antithesis of what I was doing on wall street. You know, I started turning, you know, I need to like trust and respect my clients and I need to have that personal relationship because my goal is to make them look smarter and to increase um, their per the perception of their business acumen by me coming on board. Like they have the passion and the vision, and I my goal is to bring a level of sophistication to make them look more impressive than they quote unquote are, because that's kind of the one plus one equals three, right? I mean, I'm going to sit there and have hours of conversation understanding the business model. I'm going to translate that into of um, an adult set of projections, and then we're going to try to make some rational expectation setting uh, conversations around what could we legitimately do in six, nine months, 18 months, um, and why are, this, why are these expectations reasonable? Um, why do we need this much cash? You know, what is that use of, use of proceeds? And, you know, sales and marketing is not a Band-Aid. Um, so, you know, you've, you've just got to really, again, it's got to be a very cogent, uh, thoughtful, and this is where the philosophy comes into it, right? You know, the storytelling. You know, we're trying to come up with a way to make a unicorn, um, but there has to be a rational story that gets you from point A to point B. And and I think, Tim, like, sorry, Seth, you're screwed now, I'm telling you. You just have this so, great paradigm, and, and that's how I, I, I wore the hats, because I think you have to have both, and a lot of founders don't. I mean, I, I opined for a while and kind of hid behind the fact that I was a non-technical founder. And then I realized I have the soft skills. Hard skills are great, but you have to have both. You have to have the physics. You have to have the philosophy. You have to be able to do, you know, walk the walk and talk the talk. And that's so interesting because you hit on something that if you don't understand the coach's story or the story arc, you can't see past here and you just get the hard numbers. I know for a fact, some people should not have raised as much as they did. So if you could just give us just like, because some founders like, hold on, what? Like, why would I not want to do that? The money's on the table. And you're like, well, actually, it can shoot you in the foot for X, Y, and Z. Maybe like an overarching theme in your opinion. Yeah. I'm, so there's a couple of things that have happened. Like we, we're, you know, we're old enough that we've seen a couple of uh, bubbles. You know, we, we saw the dot-com. Uh, we saw the banking bust. And right now, we're, I'm pretty sure we're seeing some semblance of a third bubble. You know, what the underlying overarching issue is, you know, quite frankly, yet to be determined. Um, but there's there's some tailwinds here and there's there's headwinds. So I think that's a really good 
um, metaphor for looking at this, you know, the headwinds and the tailwinds, because the, the low cost of money for, you know, the better part of 10 or 15 years, uh, that's a tailwind. And that's a tailwind that was such a global tailwind that most people didn't perceive it as, you know, part of the weather pattern. Um, whereas, you know, the dot-com thing was, you know, just put dot-com on it, bring every business online, that will be amazing. Well, the technology for, you know, the consumers to do the, uh, for the matchmaking online was not entirely intact. The, the logistics um, infrastructure was not necessarily intact. Um, so, you know, that, that, that slowed, that, that was a, a headwind, even though people didn't necessarily perceive it as such. Um, so we're seeing, so I, I guess I would, so with a very uh, big picture response uh, to your question is you, you need to have a pretty clear understanding of what it costs to do the thing. And you want to make sure that you have rash, you set expectations. Like, you know, it's, it's sometimes some of these funds, the tailwind is they've got a billion dollars. They can't afford to put less than 10, 20, 30 million dollars in a company because they need to move the needle on their fund. Yep. But your idea needs a million bucks. And the valuation of your idea, like I always joke that every good idea is worth a million bucks. That is the a priori Silicon Valley concept. Now, the difference between a million bucks and anything higher than that is execution. So once you understand how you're going to do the thing, now you're building enterprise value. And now you also should be able to start, you know, working backwards and doing some analysis and finding out the costs of doing the things. And that's also going to give you, you know, it's easy to have uh, the little statements like, you know, if you raise money, you should do 18 months runway. Okay, great. I mean, that, that is a good behind the veil yardstick. Um, but as a founder, you're also expected to have a little bit more prescience in the vision. Like, you know, what, what good, better, and best concept? You know, what what if things go okay? What does this business look like? How what's my traction look like? What does it cost for me to build the requisite infrastructure for this business? Um, better, okay. What let's say I get product market fit a little bit quicker. Um, how does that change the way I need to spend money? How the revenue might come in? Best, uh, just to be. Um, you know, contrarian about this, maybe I don't fully appreciate how hard it is to scale. So, you know, the best case scenario is I need way more money than I thought because scaling this thing, the difference between going to 10 customers to 100 to 1,000 to 10,000 to a million, you know, sometimes there's problems that don't crop up until you get the 10,000th customer. And, you know, the founder's the only person that's really going to have uh, a decent understanding of that crystal ball. Yeah, no, that, that's a fantastic point. We actually just went through this. There's a company I'm working with that's raising a pre-seed. And I told Raj this, it was so awkward. We had two different people around there uh, giving us this, you know, asking us this question. Let's say we're raising X, right? And they were like, okay, can you, like, we're, we're raising X to accomplish something in 12 months. They were like, can you raise 12X to accomplish the same thing in one month instead? And we were like, well, you know, we can we can go hire the best people and, you know, from like the, the big firms and whatnot, really give you the, the people on the pitch set, but they're not going to move the needle any faster. Like the reason why we have stuck with this plan is because we think it's not only something that we can achieve, but we can overachieve in the next 12 months and get you, the pre-seed investor, a better valuation. So, well, and um, I think, it, you know, the observation uh, or a thought that comes to mind that's adjacent to this conversation is, you know, there's a rule of thumb that every price round is going to be 30% dilution. And in some of the fast money times, we've seen, you know, good sales, uh, salesman founders, you know, be able to raise money at, let's say, 10% dilution. Well, there's also, you know, a, a, a little backdoor uh, approach to this, whereas maybe you aspire to raise $10 million at a 30 and then you get a little bit further down the process. You get to know your investors. Maybe you've refined your, your sharpened your pencil in the business model. You're like, you know, I only need three million bucks. 
but we've kind of got everyone nodding that this is this concept's worth thirty million, right? So I mean, I just say that as you know, that is a that's a tactical execution of a way to have a quote unquote big boy conversation with the institutional investors, and then maybe back off on the cash requirement and uh, and protect the dilution, you know, because that's that is another thing that's going to be really important right now because you've got a ton of dry capital out there. You've got some really, um, un, you know, questionable economic macro conditions. And so, you know, the biggest challenge to founders right now is not to just take the 70% valuation haircuts. How do you fight back? Um, because again, you know, the only, the only number that's carved in stone is a good idea is worth a million bucks. Everything else is negotiable. Um, and you know, the, there used to be conversations when I would talk to angel groups, um, in the Valley that we don't do, uh, valuations above 9 million. We don't do valuations above 6 million. Well, you know, I've been talking, spent a lot of time with the park city angels out here in Utah and you know, there's 65 members and they'll invest in anything at any valuation. If they believe in the founder and they believe in the business. Like we had a member that invested and lifted a billion dollars. Well, that was a pretty good investment. Um, and but you know, your first blush is wait, you want to angel round and the valuation's a billion dollars? Like I don't know what to do with that. Um, but again, you know, if I gotten the opportunity to invest in SpaceX at a billion dollars, I I'd have done it in a heartbeat. Um, just because there's some things that have been proven and de-risked and this, and you know, the sky's the limit. Um, so it, it just, I, the whole point of that, um, uh, was to, to just to make sure that everyone under, appreciates that these things are relative and, um, you really have to understand the game changing businesses versus, you know, the money makers. Um, cause you know, the other piece is what's that exit? I mean, I've met a ton of founders with interesting little businesses. I'm happy to have them as clients, but I would never invest because I was like, there's no exit here. Like you're going to make a little cash cow, but no one's going to buy this for a quarter billion dollars, you know, but you're probably going to spend five, you're going to spend five or 10 million in cash off every year, you know, but it's too small for PE. I mean, you know, again, it's just context to thinking about these things. And a, a lot of the questions and, and kind of the uh, the thinking that you're you're showing us that you do with your clients is pretty much very similar kinds of questions that you get from any investor of VCs. So going through that internally in a safe space with somebody who has access to all your information and who isn't going to bullshit you is, I think, by far like it, it's something which a lot of accelerators and in many cases some of these age VCs also try to kind of replicate in house. But there's nothing like getting a, a third party or a fresh perspective to be the big boy in the in the room. So, yeah, and it comes awesome. from being on all sides of the table. I mean, you know, I've been a founder, I'm a vendor, and uh, I'm an investor. So, you know, you you get to look at these things through you know three different perspectives. Um, and you know, I also enjoy, you know, paper napkin to Series B. I mean, that's an that's an exciting kind of whiteboard greenfield. Uh, period of time uh, for these businesses, and it's also the most challenging, um, which is also the thing that's most exciting, you know, because being an operational CFO, I mean, there's there are some incredibly well-trained individuals that, you know, with the right team and a ton of spreadsheet experience that can operate a business and fine-tune the basis points returns, uh, but that's not, you know, the passion that I have, which Again, probably takes you back to my philosophy background. Uh, so just to kind of wrap up your, your personal story, too. So Momentum Finance, is that where, like, did you start working with founders through Momentum Finance? Or did you work with some other firms in the Bay as soon as you landed? Um, I think we, we last left off there. Like, you were just in the Bay Area. Well, I did, the, I did the Lone Wolf thing for about a decade. And so I just went from, you know, founder to founder, um, opportunity to opportunity. And, you know, I, you know, I might've had my, 
uh, my thumb in one or two pies. But for the most part, I was kind of, you know, a lone wolf, didn't have a team, and was just, you know, showing up for work uh, for a period of time for, you know, a given deal. Um, and like I said, I had that epiphany because I had this bookkeeper that I was using a lot. And, it, you know, sometimes I'm not that bright. And I realized, it was like, wait a minute, I'm one of her clients. You know, I would bring her with me with every new relationship. And I was like, wait a minute, she's got five or six clients. I was like, why, why, why am I doing this the way I'm doing it? Um, and so then when I had that epiphany, I started Momentum Finance and hired a controller, hired a couple CPAs. And now I have five to 10 clients at a time. And so that smoothed out the roller coaster. Um, it also allowed me to standardize my approach. You know, we've probably got a 150 page internal operations manual. And I tell my team, I was like, we do what we do, you know, innovation, creativity. Um, that's great for product, service, sales, and marketing. But the back office, it's the right way in every other way. And I want us to do these things perfectly. I want us to do these things consistently. Um, and I also want it to be, from my standpoint as a manager, relatively interchangeable. You know, if somebody's not feeling well, somebody else can step in and we know exactly what we're doing. Even though the chart of accounts is a little different, we still have a, a standard chart of accounts approach. We still have a standard, you know, way we deal with APAR. You know, you, we have all of the uh, documentation for each company laid out the same way. You know, there's an accounting policy. So there's, you know, all the things that you need to reference uh, for the CFO and the controller to manage effectively a company's back office we standardize these processes so that things don't fall through the cracks. Oh, that's amazing. And so with, with momentum, I mean, you've been, you've been there for a while now, uh, how, like, let, let's kind of go dive a little more into your ideal founder fit, which you mentioned was on the pre seed to series B side, I'm assuming pretty agnostic because you mentioned the parts. Yeah. I mean, job. I pick, I pick founders. Um, and like I was saying before, I said, I've, so I've, I've swung, the barbell has swung, or, or the pendulum has swung all the way to the opposite. So when I first started in you know, Wall Street and finance, it was all about the numbers. Well, I've come all the way to the other side where the, the big picture business decisions are picking a founder I trust, respect, and like. And then understanding, you're not going to throw anything at me I can't figure out when it comes to the finance side. So let's help me understand understand the business model, help me understand your aspirations, um, help me understand your, you know, the assets and the liabilities, like, tell me where the bodies are buried, tell me what you're scared of, tell me what are the things that you're unsure of that you feel like maybe we need to shore up, whether it's, you know, knowledge or team or whatever, and then let's collectively problem solve this. And so that happens for two types of founders. Uh, again, it's, it happens for folks that just don't know what they don't know, uh, which are first time founders, you know, kind of out of school kind of folks or, you know, have are coming out of the workforce and trying to be your entrepreneur for the first time. Uh, and the other is, you know, my, quite frankly, my favorite founder is the recidivistic founder that is doing this, has done this many times. Um, and, you know, they know exactly what they want to do. They have a vision. They have their team. They probably have the funding lined up and they're just like, they talk to me and they're like, wait a minute. So you'll do all of this back office -y stuff. You'll put all my systems in place and all I got to do is ask a question. You'll give me a report and I can go back to the creative place I want to be and build my company. Um, that's incredibly attractive to some founders and they also have to be pretty efficient with their time. And so if we give them, 80% of their time back that they thought they were going to have to be babysitting in the back office, they have something productive to do at that time. Amazing. That was, you, you highlighted a little bit of work on the other side of the table, like as a, as an, let's call it, call you an angel, um, you know, angel to seed um, investor. Like as somebody who I'm assuming when founders do reach out to you, they understand your finance background and that you're they're going to be judging them based on certain kinds of data. But how important is it for a, a you know napkin stage or a pre-seed founder who's maybe 
free revenue, but has a product so far, how important is it for them to have all their ducks kind of in a row? Well, it's twofold. One is it's all about the founder. You know, the joke about real estate, it's all about the location. My joke in startup land, it's all about the founder. Um, you know, it, when I'm looking, when I'm evaluating a founder, I'm looking at somebody that has the personality of um, a, a, a non-quitter. You know, they have just done innovative things. That is in their nature. Uh, like one of my uh, favorite founders uh, locally started two companies and got an additional college degree before they founded this company. And it was not entirely intentional. They just kind of accidentally started a couple of businesses. Um, one was had was uh, adjacent to consumer electronics. They reverse engineered some consumer electronics uh, that turned out to be as good or better than things you could buy off the shelf. Uh, they went and got a, a computer science degree because they knew that they were going to have to understand uh, assembly language um, for their consumer electronic device. It was a they needed to have low level uh, programming skills, so they went and invested those few years before starting the company. You know, that's the kind of person you want to invest with um, because that person is just going to figure it out. Um, and it's not really in their nature to look at this as winning and losing. It's almost that curiosity for life, that curiosity for the answer is going to just lead them down different paths. And if they hit a dead end, they turn around not thinking, oh, no, I lost, I, you know, all those negative uh, feedback mechanisms that are trouble, troublesome and problematic, but they're just like, oh, there, there, there's another, you know, route for me to go check out. This one's done. It, it's almost more fun. A exactly right. And, it, and it's that attitude. It's, you know, the people that are upbeat, uh, like, you know, if you meet a founder that's angry, that's a pretty big red flag. <laughs> um, so this is part of what you're looking for is that personality fit. It's all about the founder. Now, the second piece is, are they grounded in reality? And that is, do their books make sense? Do they have a model? Do they understand that they are they need a technical co-founder? And have they identified that person? Um, you know, another thing that you meet in the early stages is people that think they're going to, they need to make a ton of progress on their own. And my joke is, one man bands fail. It was like, you know, if I meet you, and this is, more than a few months into the paper napkin stage and you don't have at least a co-founder, it's an, it's a non-starter. It was like, you know, if you can't play nice with others and you don't know how to share the pie, because the goal is in all things, uh, you know, the American uh, rationale is we're growing the pie. You know, this is, this is not um, a win lose relationship. This needs to be as many wins as there are partners. Um, and that's, that's what you're looking for is that mental approach. And, and again, this comes from the team and the culture standpoint, like you want to have somebody that is surrounding themselves with people. And also, are they enough of a salesperson that they've got a team? Like, you know, there's two, th two reasons people don't have teams. Either they can't sell the idea or they're too selfish to share. And neither one of those is, is, uh, you know, surmountable <laughs> uh, a, as a founder personality trait. No, that's, that's amazing insight. Thank you. Um, so with momentum, like, so one of the things that I've seen constantly, and it's, it's a lot more respected in Silicon Valley than I've seen in other kind of um, ecosystems. Well, Utah, we're going to talk about that ecosystem as well. I just learned that Utah is like the second biggest ecosystem by VC now, which is insane. Um, but we, so we've got a low population uh, base. <laughs> I mean, like, I keep seeing Park City and Silicon Slopes and, and all that stuff. Like, really well, you know, I moved here a few years ago and I, you know, it took me a while to come out of the COVID cave. And then I got to meet this, the, the, the startup land ecosystem. And it's robust. We have a really good uh, education network with some really strong universities. Uh, we've got a good location. So we've got a density. Um, the Silicon Slopes, the Park City, Salt Lake City, 
Provo, you know, there's there's a lot of people together in a very big state. So, you know, almost everybody lives in, I don't know, a tenth of the state. Um, and so the dynamic is really impressive. You've got very well-educated uh, young people. There's a um, – higher education is important. There's a lot of health care that comes out of this area. Uh, you've had a, just enough of a um, – prior wins where we've got a handful of uber wealthy individuals that made very successful companies over the last 30 years that are active in the community and so they they're good predictors uh they're good motivators they're good mentors um and you know it just takes a couple of unicorns in a relatively small demographic to kind of light the fire under the the young people and say you can do this too um, but yeah, Tim, you were talking about the the Utah ecosystem. Yeah, I mean, it is just such a healthy ecosystem here in Utah. We've got some really well educated folks. There, I don't know, by my estimation, there's probably about forty or fifty startups every year. Um, we've got a really uh, robust uh, pre seed seed uh, investment community. I mean, I, there's probably ten. Um, you know, institutional um, seed funds uh, here. We've got a handful of uh, bigger VCs. And then, of course, you know, once you start getting, you know, post-Series A, the community is very small. So it doesn't matter whether you're Utah or Silicon Valley or East Coast. Uh, the community knows each other. The investors do, at least. And so, you know, the ones that we have locally are are very well respected and, and have relationships with others to to bring uh, partnership investment syndication together. No, I appreciate uh, you kind of filling us in. I, like I said, Raj and I had both like kind of stumbled upon this just in the last couple of months, maybe. And uh, we're glad to know that uh, on the ground, it's a lot better. The point I was trying to make earlier was like, so in Silicon Valley, you're, C you're let's call him a CFO and a, a chief legal officer, right? Which are kind of the two most important partners you ever have but most founders don't realize in my opinion that you don't need somebody absolutely full-time at the early days you can find organizations like yours yeah i mean it's the partners and i also think the paradigm of work is is changing when you when, when you have people uh, like myself that have a little bit of gray hair and they have a little more experience you don't the, we're not the kind of people that necessarily join these uh early stages full-time and so the technology in the last 10 years has really lent itself for this fractional shared relationship to be super effective. Um, I mean, just, you know, the effectiveness of collaboration with things like the Google Sheets and the Office 365 over the last five years, the ability to, to co-work in the same document in real time has really leveraged the intellectual um, throughput um, for people collaborating. I mean, it's almost more effective than me being in the same office, being in the same conference room. It's much more effective for three of us to be looking at the same spreadsheet and the comfort of our office, uh, you know, having the equivalent of a shared screen as opposed to a shared office space. Um, and then also you have, you know, the domain expertise, you know, so I've probably... You know, so I've worked with over 100 founders. I've been a party to raising over $300 million. The pattern recognition associated with all of those activities uh, is highly valuable. And, you know, we charge hourly with a, with a modest equity component. And the reason we, we build our business that way is, quite frankly, the most valuable thing I may say to you could be a little 30-second, five-minute nugget of wisdom it's not the hours making sure your books are right. It's not necessarily the health check review where we're coming back and telling you all the things we need to adjust in your books. It might be an epiphany from a five-minute conversation that we have. Uh, and again, it's the pattern recognition. It was like, I can see a speed bump coming a mile away for a first-stage founder. It was like, you know, as simple as this guy, not a good investor, don't do the convertible note, this other guy do the safe, you know, that seems pretty easy to say, but if you make that mistake early on, 
you know, you might have just sunk. It may take a few years to manifest, but at the end of the day, the startup may fail. You know, you, you, you've got the well has been poisoned, so to speak. Well, that's, um, so, you, so again, I think that, uh, you know, it's part of this is getting, you know, there's, uh, I've got some friends that have uh, the, the fractional legal thing where they do the fixed pricing and they know that that just like we they they want to build the relationship they want to work with somebody and their pattern recognition is invaluable um and you again it's these little nuggets of wisdom where the the value is truly extracted it's it's not the uh the tactical hours that are spent that's just doing the job and the work needs to be done somebody has to be paid to do it um but the real enterprise creation um, is understanding, you know, whether a business model lends itself to a ring fence IP strategy, you know, whether we need class A, B and shares, A, B shares, whether we need a certain type of investor, you know, are you socializing with your next two and three rounds down the road of po possible investors? You know, are you doing um, the, the hard work that only comes from pattern recognition and having done it before? Hmm. And I also say some of the best super connectors in the startup ecosystem are your CFOs and your legal officers, like better so than your, your salespeople. Because yeah, they, I mean, they have I, the most I think trust. that's why we we have had a momentum finance has been successful uh, as primarily a referral practice. Is you know having those trusted uh, spheres of influence in the community. Um, and working with people on a repeat basis, just like VCs will tell you the same thing. Like I, their I favorite it, thing. It, sorry. No, I think it's more than that, though. Like if I like, again, for, for all of our listeners out there, like I'm in this position. Truly, like I would be a perfect use case. So what I'm gleaning is it's the trust case for me is also very high. It's not you trying to baffle me with bullshit using, you know, 14 syllable words or weird, you know, numbers. You're like. Actually, I don't talk AI or blockchain for our, we have a Google sheet and it works really well because it's super efficient. And you're, you're yep. like, to me, that resonates. That's like, he's not trying to, he's not trying to come over the top with some bullshit. It's like, actually, just think of this, think of this, think of this, think of this and go execute. To me, that's wildly valuable. Well, and, and it's well received on all fronts, whether you're talking to board members, whether you're talking to investors whether yep. you're talking to prospective customers yep. uh, of the founder's business. I mean, integrity, uh, trust, respect, enjoying other people's personality. I mean, this is a bit of a full circle uh, where we're getting back to technology has allowed like the three of us from three different locations to have for all the practical appearances, being in the same room for a very friendly conversation. This, this is more human than it was five or 10 years ago with some kind of remote experience. And so we're now coming back full circle. Do we enjoy spending time with each other? Are we being productive as well? And part of that is, you know, this is pretty good about uh, mirroring body language. You know, that 90% of communication is nonverbal. We're capturing some percentage of that uh, in this medium. Um, and again, you know, there's certain the blocking and tackling of starting a small business and building the revenue and building the team to provide the variable cost support infrastructure, you know, we're just trying to be productive. Um, and at the end of the day, we're just a bunch of humans that are trying to figure out how to work together effectively. And that's where I also think there's a paradigm shift that's happened the last few years with this whole fractional relationship, uh, whether it's dev, dev teams, whether it's fractional marketers, uh, the finance, the legal. I mean, all of these things, if you have a good um, communication paradigm, well, you know, you only need an hour of my time a month to answer a couple of key questions to make sure that you're focusing on the thing that's most productive. You know, um, the, the dev team, you only need to look them in the eye 45 minutes a day and then let them go code and then check in tomorrow and make sure everybody's, you know, marching in the same direction. Um, you know, your PR, your marketing people, you got to check in once a week. 
Anything changed? Anything I should be worried about? Any of these articles that my competitors have published? You know, I mean, all of these things, What most of this is pattern recognition. Uh, so there's very efficient uh, give and take that can happen now due to technology that I think lends itself to distributed teams as opposed to, you know, having 50 people in the same office building. And, and to, to follow up on that, it does seem, especially we talk about, you know, what we don't know, and you can see the model way of, hey, are you are you fraternizing? Are you are you laying the seed for your next round, your next funding, and your next funding? So it does seem like, Tim, you work, because I think maybe there's a stigma, and I could be projecting, um, of, oh, fractional, not full-time, but it seems like you go from soup to nuts. Do you follow your companies and your founders into, hey, listen, if this works on an A or a B or a C, momentum's with you through and through? Well, I that I think goes without saying from the standpoint of we want to be an equity shareholder. So we're a stakeholder. That's true. That's so, true. you know, it's not just me getting that invoice paid every month. It's, yeah. you know, me three, five, seven years down the road. Um, you know, I have probably become kind of passive uh, once you've graduated. I mean, we have maybe a 36-month half-life with our clients, okay. right? And so, but there's... You know, it's kind of a seven to 10 year game. We want to be on that cap table. If nothing else, we're, um, we're an investor. So when I'm no longer the active CFO, I'm still getting quarterly updates from my founders. I'm still answering phone calls. They're still looking at my thousands of LinkedIn connections and say, hey, can you introduce me to so-and-so? And I'm like, happily, let's, let me do a three-way call. Let me organize a lunch. Um, and it's also my passion. Right. I mean, you know, if if I wanted to make money, so to speak, I think I could have built a very different firm where I had 50 employees and a bunch of people going out doing stuff. I built, yeah. you know, a lifestyle firm where a I lifestyle. am always working yeah. with my founders yeah. um, because this is my this is what I enjoy doing. Now, I figured out a way for it to be, um, you know, rewarding uh, for, for for myself and my team. And it's also what drives me. It's what I get up and do. And, you know, I'm excited about looking at my calendar in the morning, looking and seeing which founders I'm talking to and what problems am I trying to solve. Um, and I think that that leads me to another train of thought that, you know, when we first meet a founder, whether it's, you know, if it's a paper napkin, it's a blank slate. So, you know, we get to avoid a bunch of mistakes. But if it's anyone that's operated for a period of time, the first uh, order of engagement for us is the health check. You know, my controller and I will spend five or 10 hours going through the books. And basically we go, we'll build a punch list after reviewing uh, the income statement, balance sheet, and, and cash flow. And this becomes a punch list for prioritization of things we need to fix. You know, we're going to do a remapping exercise for the chart of accounts, make this thing look more 10K-esque, make this thing more e easily translatable, um, make the budget versus actuals make sense. Because, I mean, there's a a through line with historical uh, numbers, your projections, and then kind of the pitch deck, what's coming out of the founder's mouth, those line items, those account names, that financial nomenclature needs to be consistent across all three of those. Otherwise, you create, create cognitive dissonance and people lose the, the through line. And then they're trying to make sense of what's going on. And so that's part of, I think, the puzzle solving. Uh, to this is, you know, showing people how to how to avoid a lot of easily avoidable mistakes. Because again, you know, some people haven't been in, you know, 50 board meetings. Some people haven't been on the other end of 50 term sheets. Uh, you know, and so you're going to start understanding the tone of these conversations. Uh, it's It's what's not said is almost as important as what is said in certain conversations. And, um, and that's that's where I think the puzzle solving and the joy comes from what otherwise would be seemingly innocuous conversations. Are there any other questions so far? I'll keep I'll keep the peanut gallery quiet. <laughs> <laughs> no, this this has been a lot of fun. Um I mean so I wanna bring the the kind of conversation a little uh, back because we we went uh, really into detail about how you judge the founder, right? Or how you are you're vetting the founder. But then once you're past that step, that stage, 
uh, with the hell check and what what else is important to you before you take on a new client or, or you start working with another team not just the founder um well you know i'll accept i'm a little broken record here again the founder i have to trust respect and like them uh once you've identified that personality fit then you start you know the gap analysis right what's missing what what needs to be strengthened you know what's awesome uh, what do we need to prioritize? What do we need to deprioritize? Um, you know, what does a team look like? Uh, what is the support base? You know, what are their advisor relationships? Um, what What is the path towards the board looking like? Who are the potential investors, uh, medium and longer term? You know, what what's the right industry fit? And once you've kind of identified all of that, you know, let's just assume that, you know, it's a, the, it's a green light go decision. You know, we're moving forward. Well, I got another piece of this perception is reality. So I, I was talking about an equity research. What separates uh, the men from the boys in that and the women from the girls is the storytelling. Everybody is expected at that point uh, to have a bulletproof spreadsheet. But is it a sum of the parts analysis? Like, you know, the one plus one equals three. Is this a, a cash flow? Is this a triple expanding margins? Like increasing market share, decreasing costs, you know, um, you know, uh, decreasing CAC. You know, what, what, are the, what are the tailwinds that we're looking at? And it's also really coming back full circle. I always joke with my founders about this. Perception is reality. So everybody knows the numbers are made up. But how credible are your made up numbers? Because if they look like an IBM kind of rational spreadsheet or, um, you know, as opposed to, you know, like FTX, like, you know, they're both made up numbers. They're both a lot of trust is going into assuming that the information we're being presented is accurate. But if you can peel the onion just a little bit and, and show that you had really cogent assumptions and we're being conservative, like, I'm looking at this cost assumption. It's a little bit higher than I really think it is. And this is why I did that. You explain, these are the financial notes, right? You've got the standardized 10K with the P&L, which is, you know, eight or nine, 10, 15 line items. But you've got these little, you know, these italicized one, twos, and threes in the corner. Well, those are your financial notes where you're saying this is the specific information to help you understand why I made this assumption or why this number is something to be proud of. Like, you know, my CAC of $300 is awesome because the lifetime value of my customer is 40000 Or, you know, a CAC of $10 is horrible because the lifetime value is $12, right? I mean, you have to have context. And again, telling the story correctly, this is where the perception is reality becomes so germane because we're trying to say, I'm trying to tell you a story about where we're going. I'm trying to tell you a story about myself and how credible I am. Why am I the right person to solve this problem? Like, did I not only identify the problem correctly, do I have a rational solution? And why am I the right person to deliver that solution? You know, back to the kind of the Guy Kawasaki template pitch deck. You know, you got those 10, 15 slides and don't veer from them because it's not broken. You know, you're trying to tell a very concise story in a very quick, cogent manner. And, um, and that's, that's where I kind of came up with this. Um, the corollary to the storytelling is the perception is reality because quite frankly, early in the startup game, there is no reality. So all we can do is tell a cogent, well thought out story and that perception will become reality, you know, because Every, you know, Uber started off as a concept, um, and they had to tell that story uh, where it really resonated. You know, I mean, Elon with SpaceX, that was a hard story to tell. But, you know, eventually he got, uh, you know, enough success that people bought into the story, you know, because until that third rocket worked, you know, there was reality was not good, <laughs> you know, uh, but that turned perception on a dime. You know, this is possible. 
this person can do this thing that seems like they're boiling the ocean, uh, but indeed it is possible. So this is the right person to pursue this audacious goal. Hmm. Yeah, like, uh, uh, well, just focus on the next set of people who are going to keep believing in you and then instead of the bigger picture. Oh, that's amazing. Um, all right, so how how do people find Momentum Finance or how do people convince you to work with them? Uh, well, you know, like I said, I, I, my preference is a referral. Uh, so get to know somebody that knows me. I mean, I've, I've, people will reach out to me on LinkedIn and, and I'll tell them that I said, we'll find somebody, find a friend in common. Um, just because there's a huge amount of trust, respect and sunk cost in a relationship. Like, you know, quite frankly, this goes both ways. I mean, you don't want 90 days in to find out you don't like my personality or that I'm not as you know pragmatic as you would like in this one way that is mission critical to you as a founder, um, or you know I just don't do things the way you want them done. I mean sometimes personality fits. Uh, there's a bad fit. I mean I've I've probably fired three clients uh, in the decade as Momentum Finance, and it was a personality fit. You know one guy was just uh, you know the way they treat my team. Uh, or the way they treat me, and I'm like, hey man, life is life is uh, short, and we're all here on the same team, and we're trying to win, and what we're doing is hard. And so, you know, if we're taking our frustrations out on each other, you know, that is not a good approach, or at least it's not an effective approach. That I want to sign up as a fractional guy. Like, you know, I've heard there there are some pretty demanding founders out there, and that's all well and good. But you just got to manage the relationship and the risk uh, benefit profile has to be correct, right? I mean, some people are very antagonistic and it's their nature, right? Uh, and it's not necessarily a bad thing. And they both sign up for that. Um, you know, I, I am, I am a, you know, a pretty thoughtful, quiet person that is really trying to move the needle in an in a effective way as possible. But that's, I'm not necessarily that uh, gregarious or extroverted. You know, that, that's, that's good to know uh, for a founder that maybe is really extroverted and actually their decision-making is somewhat confrontational. Like, that is not an intrinsically negative thing if your co-founder resonates with it. If you, kind of, if you both go off that vibe and you get somewhere productive at the end of the day and you don't feel worn out, more power to you, uh, but it's a personality fit. Um, so I would say, you know, find me on LinkedIn, reach out, um, you know, find somebody that we have a, a connection in common. And, you know, the other thing that helps you do is find out what they think of uh, working with us. That makes a lot of sense. Um, you, you mentioned this kind of briefly before where Momentum Finance has, uh, as a system with over $300 million in financing, can you t speak to a little about like what are for, for you as a financial advisor, right? Really for the founders um, on the personal and professional side, because that's also a big element, which a lot of founders uh, kind of, I believe this is that your CFO or whoever your financial partner is, it's also their fiduciary duty to make sure that the founders are, are just as protective as the company. So um, when they, when they go to go to VCs, like in your lens, what are some mistakes early stage founders are making, which are they could have the best financials, they could probably have a, a sure. good story, but they're still not getting over that. Well, there's a handful of things, and I and I know it seems a a theme here. It's about the the storytelling. So you can go look at the templates, like the guy Kawasaki pitch deck. You can have the best pitch deck in the world. But if there's not that compelling through line, the storyline of why are you important, like you're the number one actor in the story. Like I say, that founders are the most important component of startup land. If that, if you're, if you're kind of t taking, this is a problem, this is the solution, this is the team, this is, you know, if you go through that cadence, but you haven't convinced me that you're the, 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 the silver bullet, you're the, the special ingredient in the cake 
that makes your cake special and it makes your cake unique, then you've missed the point of the, of the story. You know, you're the hero. And if you can't convince me that not only are you the best hero for this story, you're the only hero. You're the only person that's going to be able to, to do this. Um, then you've missed the plot. The second piece is you need to be a gregarious, outgoing, outgoing, happy person. You need to build these relationships. Like, I can't, I, maybe one in a hundred pitch decks gets sent over the transom to an investor cold and gets funded. Like, what normally happens is you go to all these meet and greets. You know, there's a, there's a vibrant uh, social community in Utah. There's founders and funders. There's um, the kiln events. I mean, they, you know, I could go to three events a week. And, and to hang out with 10 to 50 funders at each of these events. Um, and this is where you start building relationships and you start having a persona. You're not just, you know, person A, founder A, raising money. Here's my deck. Please call me. I'll send you the safe note. Like that is that approach rarely works. What it is is building, you know, who's the human? Make this person 3D. Why do I care about this person? Why do I want them to succeed? How do they treat the people around them? Oh, I think I would really like to see this person be successful. I think they're going to make our community even better if they have a bunch of uh, money. I mean, this is, again, tangential story here, but I've talked to founders and I said, look at the, let's talk about exits. So you've got this interesting idea. You're going to make a, uh, you're going to raise a few million dollars. If somebody offers you $50 million, you still own 20% of the company. You had $10 million in your account. Would that change your life? Most founders, that would radically change their life. I said, are you a one-trick pony? Do you think you might be able to do something again? I don't know. But if they have the right personality, they're probably just innovative and creative on their own. You know, some early founders, I'm like, build this company as, as quickly as you can. If somebody offers you 50 million dollars think about it that might change your life that might change all of your employees lives let somebody else scale that into a unicorn business but now you've got 10 million dollars in your bank account how's that going to radically change your life your family's life and your ability to change the world around you i mean i'll i'll, I'll tangentialize again but this is a, in this economic uh downturn that we're incorporating right now what brings America out of this? Startups, small businesses. You know, the next Google, the next Facebook, the next SpaceX, right? So what you want is you want a ton of people that have been lost their job, disenchanted with their work, find something they're passionate about, try to figure out that it's something productive that really should would benefit the world by being coming into existence, and then pursue it with all their passion and strength and heart, this is what's going to turn around. Uh, this is what's going to get us out of this current economic malaise is, you know, people that were laid off starting a company and it five years from now having hundreds of employees. Right. I mean, so that's, uh, that is a rarely winding road answer. <laughs> oh, that, that's amazing. Even right now, I think that the current number is about 30,000, uh, people laid off in the last like 12 months, unfortunately. But if you look at, yeah, the I mean, think about people, that. Maybe 10% are, you know, have the right personality to be founders, you know, and then 10% of those will be successful. And then, you know, three to five years from now, those successful people will have, you know, hundreds of thousands of employees. Um, you know, I think that's a pragmatic way to look at it because you're hearing that from a lot of early stage VCs that the last six months has been really interesting to see the ideas that are coming to them because of all these highly, um, you know, well-trained individuals that got laid off and are just like, well, I don't want to go get another job and I'm smart enough and well healed enough that I can take six months and try to figure out a new business. And, um, you know, and plus there's just all this creativity. I mean, this AI machine learning stuff. I mean, if you're a coder, the tools that you have on your desktop right now, 
are second to none in, in the history of mankind. I mean, you know, you can do amazing work with small teams right now. Absolutely. Well, I want to hone in a little because you, you've seen the success side uh, very much so, but you've also seen a lot of failures, I, I imagine, whether they had everything going, you know, company growing and, and whatnot. Like, Coming from the finance side and, and somebody whose job it is to make sure all the, the company's ducks are, are you know, kind of well laid out in a row, what are some of the other horse blinders maybe some founders have had that you have noticed, uh, you know, patterns of in the failures? I would say the number one um, attribute for success in my mind is people that are solving a problem they have doing it effectively, and then having other people raise their hand and go, hey, can I, uh, can I use that? Um, you know, the, the biggest blunder I see is people perceiving somebody else's problem, trying to solve it, and trying to build a business on that when they don't have the problem. Like they're trying to put themselves in somebody else's mind uh, to solve a problem. And so one of the things that uh so i've i've seen a bunch of founders um you know i i, I attend the screening committee calls uh, for the park city angels and so we we see six or so founders every month and the ones that impress me are the ones that are solving their problem like i woke up i perceived this problem i wanted to fix it and then i had the epiphany well i'll bet some other people have the same perceived problem and they're going to want to use my solution. Um, now, sometimes you, that you have to change that paradigm a little bit. Like someone has to perceive a problem that's not an individual problem. It's a societal problem. It's an industrial problem. Um, you know, talking to, uh, working with a founder right now that has uh, spent a ton of their own money and a ton of their time uh, trying to do uh, tunneling with plasma. And the, with a plasma torch. And it was, you know, once you address the cost of electricity, you've reduced the cost of building a tunnel uh, by almost a, an order of magnitude. That's pretty incredible. Well, you know, the primary reason we don't have uh, underground electricity in America is we're so big and it's so expensive. You know, Europe spent a ton of money putting most of their utility lines underground and Lo and behold, they probably have a lot less uh, forest fires, right? Because they have a lot less high, high voltage cables running through the middle of nowhere where no one's aware of, you know, a problem until it's too late. Um, well, if you could build thousands of miles of underground tunnels uh, at a radically cheaper, you would solve a, a ton of problems, right? So, again, that's, uh, you know, that's an engineering heavy example. Um but, uh, you know, met a lot of female founders uh, in Utah that are creating businesses that employ other, um, other women and solving their own problems. And they have built, you know, multi-million dollar businesses and are now going out and raising their first third-party capital. Um, you know, they solved a problem that they had um, and they totally proved product market fit. And now they're going out and raising money. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's kind of the other pieces you want to see people that are doing this almost for the passion or the love of it. You know, anyone that's like, I'm going to go make a million dollars, you know, let's see how to, you know, trying to reverse engineer wealth through a startup that just doesn't usually work out well. Um, so it's, again, it's so that's interesting why too, because we're wed to that. So I, I had a friend and he was the exact same way. And he's, he tried to like, I want to make whatever and then he tried to he tried to reverse engineer and i, I could tell i was like and then i even i, I postulated it was like why that random number and he was just he had nothing and i was like do you get what i'm trying to get? like it's exactly that tim like he tried to back into it or like certain margins or, or a certain amount of equity and i'm like do you have any thought process no okay well, and it's the thing is, what's you know, what's the you know the joke in Silicon Valley? It's you know, chewing glass and staring into the abyss. You know, being a successful founder is typically not fun. 
being a successful founder that's exited, that's a ton of fun. But the journey was hard. And the journey was relatively thankless. And the journey was not, there's obviously glimmers of hope and hopefully you're enjoying the journey. But it's hard work. I mean, especially when you're trying to create something you may not know it's possible to do. Um, and that's one of the, the things where we're not all destined to be founders of really successful businesses. You know, I think my personality lends itself to I'm a good founder for Momentum Finance, which is a support. I'm part of the startup land infrastructure, right? I mean, I am not a fintech startup. This company is never going to be worth a billion dollars, but it's going to create, you know, nice uh, returns for, for me and mine, and it's going to be good for the team, and we're going to help a ton of founders create value. But, you know, we're more the plumbers in this industry than we are, you know, one, one, a CEO, so to speak. And a lot of people know thyself. Um, understand your personality. You know, are you the right person to go out and raise money? Are you the right person to talk to 50 strangers and continue being upbeat the next morning when those 50 conversations didn't go well? Because if you're not, you're probably not a good, you're, you, you may not have the right predisposition to be a good founder because this is tough stuff. Um, and, you know, you're going to be served uh, some humble pie along the way. Uh, you're going to hit some speed bumps you didn't expect. You're going to have some things that didn't go your way, not because you did something wrong, just because fate is what it is. Um, and you're just going to have to be resilient. Um, you know, sometimes being single is good. Sometimes being a family person is good. I mean, all of these considerations kind of go into, are the, is, is this going to be successful? Right, because again, you don't control all of the 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 things that are going to happen to you in your founder's journey. Uh, so that resilience and that dedication and that passion, you need to have some things that get you through. Uh, you know what we affectionately call the ramen noodle days. That's so cool. <laughs> no, it's like a it's like a one on one um, kind of like a therapy session for founders right now. It, it is. It, that's exactly what it is. It's a self awareness thing, and I think it's extremely important. And 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 Tim, it's it's so refreshing to hear you speak this way. And obviously, you can tell not just because you keep pontificating about your gray hair that you've been through this. You get it. I mean, there's zero ego in all the stuff that's coming out of your mouth. And you know, again, being someone in the immediate use case, it's like. Yeah, I, I'm fourth company and I just want to go ham. But at the same time, at four or five, you know, four o'clock, both my kids are done with school. And I'm like, shit, like at this point in life, what type of founder do I want to be? And it's hard. It's super hard because you keep, where's my tech crunch article? It's like, yeah, or it's the lifestyle where I'm like, I'm going to go walk to get my kid from school. Totally. Yeah. I mean, you know, I have met founders uh, that are a little bit older. And I tell him, I said, don't get me wrong, but this job is kind of a 70, 90 hour a week job for three to seven years. Like that's what it takes for the headlines that you're aspiring to. If you want to make a, a modest six figure income and have a modest seven figure exit. Yeah. You can play this game a little differently. Your investors aren't going to be happy with you. You're going to lose a lot of friends along the way because it was like, well, is this startup land or is this small business? There's a big difference, right? Yeah. Like you could, like, you know, you can build a small, a successful small business, but it's not going to get angel investing. It's not going to get a technical co-founder. If in reality, it's a lifestyle business. And you need to be very honest with yourself about that because you can't make that decision down the road. You can't accept other people's money and then dial it back a year from now. Like you want to piss a lot of people off, do that. <laughs> yeah. On the VC side, unless you're, if you're holding their money or like just not using it for what you said, it's, it becomes a big deal. 
Well, and also, you know, a small business, the the expectation of an exit is that that's not part of the conversation. But a startup is it is every bit a part of the conversation. It should be slide seven or nine, and you should be telling me whether it's M and A or IPO, and I should be able to judge you whether I think you're qualified to be a public company CEO. Uh, you know, there are a lot of aspirational statements that need to be made and that I need to vet. And I need to go, I don't think this person's qualified. Doesn't mean they're not the right person now. We're going to replace them at the Series B. But, you know, there's a lot of things that can, along the path to success, everybody wins, but let's be realistic about it on the outside. And that's where the pattern recognition comes in, right? I mean, you know, a lot of the first-time founders, they don't even know themselves. Not their fault. They're young. They're going to figure it out. We're signing on to be part of the ride. But, you know, other people, have, you know, should know better, and they have the aspirations, and just be transparent about it. Um, you know, and that's where I think it's been interesting. I was at uh, the Investor's Choice event in Salt Lake City a couple weeks ago by uh, Venture Capital Org. And we there's there was a handful of institutional investors that are doing the revenue-based funding, which is, you know, an interesting alternative. You know, you've got the lighter capitals of the world, but you've also got some VCs that are doing things like, all right, I'll give you this money and I get 50% of your revenue until I'm paid back. Uh, no dilution. I get my money back plus some kind of mutually agreed upon return. And then if this thing is, you know, morphs into a lifestyle company, I don't care. Not my, you know, I'm not upset about that. You know, so, and that, that is a way to fund a small business, right? And that is not the aspirational VC model where one in 20 have to become a unicorn or the business model fails, right? So, I think there's also that pragmatism now where you're starting to get a lot of capital in the markets that are looking at, well, maybe this doesn't need to be a startup land venture. Maybe this could be a good small business. Maybe this thing will generate $50 million over the next 10 years, and there is no seller or buyer. Um, you know, maybe, you know, PE isn't interested in this. You know, this company isn't going to be acquired, isn't going to go public, but it's going to generate 100 jobs. It'll be great for this community, and the two or three owners will make $10 million each. That sounds like a successful story to me. So, you know, there, there's different ways to look at this, and I think that's also the way um, for people to be a little more pragmatic because I think startup land and the people's awareness of the angel ecosystem and the founder mentality this is something that we want to espouse. We want everyone to embrace. What I do think we need to also let people know is there's a ton of off ramps. Not everything is going to be, you know, uh, feast or famine, you know, unicorn or death. You know, the, there's nothing wrong with, you know, a successful little cash cow small business. Uh, you just have to be somewhat prescient up front because otherwise you're going to get the wrong capital and you're going to have some grumpy people and then you're going to have a divorce and a business divorce is ugly. It's wild. And so, so efficient for startup studio stuff really is. And and just what, because the thought process and the mindfulness for a lot of founders right now, it's not pragmatic. It's just not. And we also have this false sense of entitlement. Um, Tim, Seth is probably bored of this, but I always, like I always say, and I don't care who hears, like, I'm not sure I'm going to be a great CEO. I'm not. And you fundamentally just brought that to your attention. Like, hey, listen, you might be right for the right thing, but in your B, we're going to get you out. And I never understood, like, shit, how the board vote him out of his own company? But then I, I iterate back to five physicians in my family, um, was going to go into orthopedics. Cool. Six hip surgeries a day and great. You make your millions and awesome. Shoot me in the face because I'm so bored. The monotony to me as a founder, I don't want to mess with it. It's that, it's that, it's that Nintendo game where you're like, oh crap, that that's blocked. I don't care. My curiosity is that all the side quests that make me really happy. So I even tell Seth, I'm like, the penny gap theory for me, like I'd be housed from from the ER. I'd be like, here's a problem. I like the, solving the penny gap. You go from penny gap to to ten million AR. Awesome, I'm your guy. The ten million to hundred million, it's like. 
Nah, we systematized it. We threw some gas on it. That's like CEO. So obviously I'm being a little, you know, jocular with everything. Sure. You say, but I think it's so important going into this to really know who you are. And Seth even went as far to give me a super, I was, I was like, what is this shit? A 50 question, like a 50 question questionnaire about me. Right. When you get stressed out or sad, how do you lead? Do you lead? Do you fall apart? Do you need your co-founder to not be in a depressive state? When you, and then we're like, and then I took a step back. I'm like, shit, wildly valuable because it doesn't have to be a unicorn or an IPO. It could be an off ramp here. And I could, and, and the juxt, you know, the paradigm shift in my brain, that's okay. That's okay. So I think, you know, really makes a lot of sense, especially on the startup studios platform for people to start knowing who they are, because you can't start to start talking about the future if you don't know the present. Well, and also understanding, you know, again, like we said, that there are a bunch of off ramps, because if you look at this and say, all right, let's let's reverse engineer this, not from the fine point of I need to make X millions, right? But from, okay, maybe this is only a $50 million idea. So what, how do, how do I build a company that's worth $50 million? Like that's a different investor base. That's a different advisor base. Uh, you know, potentially that's a different fractional CFO. Potentially, potentially that's, you know, your IP strategies differently. I mean, your partner strategies differently. This is a regional company. It will never be more than that. You know, all of these things to, if you start getting, if you're honest with yourself, and then you really have a super clear vision of I'm going to build a $50 million company over the next five or 10 years. That's sufficient. That's yeah. going to help my community. And that, but it was like, there's, there, there's not much else there. Like the, the TAM, SOM, all of that analysis. This is, this is never going to be a VC company. Right. Well, you will save yourself a ton of heartache if you understand that fairly early on. Because then all of a sudden, you know, that's almost a qualifier for like social impact investing, right? Because then all of a sudden someone goes, oh, if I invest in you, I'm going to lift up 50 households in this community over the next decade. I'm in. You mean I'm going to get my money back? I'm going to get a return on my money and the return of my money? Like, that's pretty cool. Like that, you know, that's a DAF investor, the, the donor funds advisor you know yeah. where where they love it they get the money back they get to go invest in another startup this is fun for them they're not it is nothing to do with net worth at that point um you know so this is part of what i really agree should be part of the startup land conversation where this is not just about vcs and unicorns and you know because this is this is this is the the backbone of america you know individuals they don't want to work for somebody else. We should empower them to build an, a cute little company. And yes, it might accidentally become a unicorn. And yes, it just might, you know, become an, a pillar of the industry in their community. Like, you know, it doesn't have to be huge to be a success. That's Seth, I'm glad crazy. like you can't get on the Momentum Finance website. I'm so glad we're going to be the con like the conduit to him. Yeah. <laughs> No, this uh, I knew this was gonna be a lot of fun because I know Raj is a financial nerd, and then Tim is growing up with you, or or seeing you through the years. Um, <laughs> before we we kind of um, kind of end because we're we're towards the end of the our time limit. Um, I do want to highlight your love for sailing because that was a big part of when we first met. You invited me on your boat. I didn't go because I couldn't swim at the time. But I will join you next time. Um, but, you know, I, I want you to kind of tell our audience a little about that passion because it's I believe it's a big part of it. Um, yeah, I mean, I you know, I got two outdoor sports uh, gifts from my, my dad early. I was put on skis at three, and I was put uh, on a sailboat at seven, and I was racing lasers, those little cute single-sail, 13-foot sailboats. I remember I was picking up and carrying that thing when it was bigger than I was. And... Um, you know, I used to take my friends out with a saltwater, I mean, a freshwater lake in uh, southwest Virginia where I grew up, and I'd put five, six kids on that boat. We'd go out, and we'd turn it upside down, and lots of screaming and flailing, and then we'd flip it up and sail back and just have a ton of fun. And, you know, having that skill set, then when I got to the Bay Area, 
it is one of the most magical places to sail in the world because in the summer you've got this dedicated 20 knot wind coming under that bridge you know six eight hours a day you know the it's the it's really interesting the geography is when it's above 90 degrees in the central valley in california you've got wind in the san francisco bay and it is just amazing i mean i just go out and i'll do laps under the golden gate bridge and um you know it is it's amazing because it's you know it is one of the oldest sports known to man sports you know that it was it was a way of traversing early on but i mean you're out there there's no engine um you're watching the wind i mean i'll sit there and people tease me that i'm not watching where i'm going i'm staring at the top of the mast uh watching the wind needle and um you know but it's it's a very visceral sport and um you know and it's one of those sports where you'll never you you will get better um but you'll never know it all you know because the wind's always changing um the dynamics of the water are always changing and uh you know it's 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 a very uh uh no pun intended it's a very flow related sport uh not because you're paying attention to the wind reacting to your sail uh and then secondarily the boat and you're not trying not to hit anything um but it's uh it's uh it's a just a a very organic sport and uh really allows you to to focus on uh what you're doing and it's a great social sport too i mean i one of my favorite things about taking people out sailing is i can worry about sailing they just got to worry about holding on and not spilling their drink oh, that's amazing tim thank you so much raj usually ends with a question Go for it, bro. yeah it's it's cheeky and it's this the guy raz you know how i built this um so tim percentage wise of your success luck versus hard work I would say 60% luck. I mean, I've always worked hard. I mean, in equity research, I worked 110 hours a week for three years, you know, so I feel like I put my, my paid my dues. Um, but it's really who you meet, um, who you end up working with, um, and how you manage those relationships. So it's, you know, no matter what the percentage split is, it's more luck than, than anything else. Thank you so much. Just uh, to end it, you know, usually we try to to give flowers. One of the perks of having this podcast to uh, not only reconnect with people that we know, but then to also highlight that kind of personal relationship, right? So over the years, like I said, I met Tim randomly through a LinkedIn connection, um, reaching out because I needed a panelist at 50. He was not only nice enough to give me that time, but this was when I was trying to raise a fund for startups. And one of the few VCs and, and people in the industry who anytime I would call or email, like, hey, come over to San Francisco, let's hang out. Any question I had, when I moved to Pakistan, a big, there, there was a period uh, with that fund where I wanted to bring, uh, you know, experts from the U.S. and try to help over there. Tim was on that as well, like, whenever you need him. And then when we were raising for Delta, one of the few people who I reached out to who sent me, like, a, this huge, you know, like, 10-page uh, kind of response about like not only what was wrong with every single slide on our pitch so uh, you, you can't really get at uh, you know from everybody so thank you so much Tim not only personally but I'm excited to highlight you on this podcast get your name there in, in the ecosystem and uh, awesome well you thank you very much and it's been a pleasure talking to both of you and thank Tim you so I'm going to follow up with you through through a referral from Seth okay that sounds great <laughs> I look forward to it <laughs> thanks again Cheers. everybody take care bye guys